Jordan, what's happening, man? How you feeling today? What's up, Sam? How you doing, boss? I'm fantastic. I'm super excited to have our guest on today, Madeline Bennett. She is the head of international at Spotify Music. She has a really interesting role where she's able to help lead an artist partnerships team, an editorial team, and a strategy team that focuses on planning and operations as it pertains to all things international music. We dive into how artists can partner with Spotify, what they look for when featuring artists on playlists, massive international markets and cities to consider when you're trying to build a fan base around you or an artist you're working with, and how to lead and operate a high-performing team. What stood out to you in this episode, Jordan? Uh, that last point that you made, which is how to lead a high-performing team. Um, I think her talking about people management, just in terms of how to scale people's careers, was really interesting. I think her getting into strategy and operations and how important it is to keep scale in mind at every level. Um, super, thought it was super interesting about the different markets and how they all bring something to unique, uh, something unique to the table, and also how to utilize markets for a local fan base. How to really tap into the markets that Spotify. If I has to find a fan base that's not necessarily where you're based. Um, but before we get into it, I want to shout out every single patron that donated to our Patreon. This past week, we hit a huge milestone, which was $250 a month. We're a little bit more than that now. And that means that the Spotify is the, the, the uh, Patreon, or sorry, the podcast is no longer costing us any more money out of our pockets. Um, it's a huge moment for us because this is not something that Sam and I were not invested in from the beginning, both financially, physically being on location in New York, emotionally with every single guest, and it feels really good that you guys invested us back. So today we're gonna shout out every single person who is on our Patreon. So we got Dennis, Joey, Seti, Taj, Raul, Darren, Justin, David Lee, Jeremy, Sides, NC, Austin, Connor, Pam, Armand, Patricia, who's my grandma, shout out grandma, Jason, <laughs> another Connor, Ethan, Brady, Fabrice, who helped sponsor us with a place where we had nowhere to go in, with, in bands in town, uh, my uncle, Kevin, my uncle Kevin, and the first patron, Danny. I uh, just want to shout out everybody, the community. I look forward to it every single day. I look forward to speaking to everyone every single day. I look forward to helping with everybody's careers. And if there's anything I could ever do for any of our patrons, please let me know. Sam, what do you think? Super grateful. I think this means that we're able to kind of continue to reinvest back into the podcast to create more content, articles, videos, clips. I think it's really important for us to try and create a thriving resource for to, to help people in the music industry grow and thrive. And I think even within the community, outside of just the donations, I think it's been really helpful and amazing to see all the, the incredible conversation and how supportive everybody is within our Discord chat, helping each other, giving feedback and ideas on different strategies and questions. So super grateful for everybody that's involved. If you do want to learn more, you can check us out at musicbusinesspodcast.com slash community but don't want to take us any further away from this week's incredible episode with Madeline. So let's get into it. Madeline, thanks for coming to the Music Business Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. So I guess just for starters, um, what are the roles that you, what are the roles you're responsible for at Spotify? For sure. I'm the head of international music at Spotify. Um, which is one of the kind of key roles in Spotify's music team. And I specifically look after our international division, which is our international playlisting, our international partnerships team, and our international strategy team. Um, and international to me really means anything that exists between nations. So Spotify mm. has 92 markets, 299 million users, and I really focus on all those connections and that kind of um, interconnectivity between countries and regions. It's really a, it's a dream job. I love it. That's amazing. Can you dive a little bit deeper into the three different kind of like sub functions or sub teams that you're working with and helping lead? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the, you know, the music team at Spotify is one of the oldest divisions at Spotify, obviously. Uh, when we launched, you know, music was the whole uh, kind of heartbeat of the company and continues to be um, the heartbeat of the company. There are a few core competencies in the music team. So 
The first division is that artist partnerships team. And that is the group of people that work with artist managers, directly with artists and with record labels, majors and indies to really make sure that we are partnering with the industry. Um, you know, we really feel like Spotify can provide a platform for creators and for artists, but that magic that is happening and those types of artistic decisions that are driving the industry forward, that happens outside of Spotify. And we need to stay very, very closely connected to, um, to artists and their teams. So we call it a partnerships team because that's really what we aspire to do is strike partnerships with artists um, where they turn to us and we help them reach fans and connect with audiences. And we turn to them to understand what the process is of becoming an artist, what they need, what we can do to kind of build towards a brighter future for them. So that's one team, partnerships. We do some marketing work. We do a lot of communications. We do a lot of education on how to use Spotify. Um, the second division is our editorial team, and that is a group of people that are really focused on Spotify's users and the user journey. So how do we make sure that we're providing the right song, the right playlist, the right connection for every user at every moment? So when you open the Spotify app, what do you see? What type of music are you serving? That's our, our um, editorial or curation function. And then there's a third division in the international team at Spotify, which is a market strategy and operations function. And these are some of the thinkers that help us plan for the future, plan for 2025, um, keep the markets connected around big album launches, around new product feature rollouts or alpha beta testing that we might be doing. So you kind of have your partnerships people, your editorial people and your strategy function in the center. Cool. So I guess let's kind of break each one down a little bit more, if that's okay with you. Of course. Um, so for artist partnerships, and this is also a question that we got from one of our patrons as well, is um, what kind of goes into the decision making of the artists that you're going to partner with? Obviously, there's some, I assume there's some details that you can't get into for that, but um, kind of like a high level, like what what are some of the things that you look for? Um, obviously, Spotify is not just a music company, but it's a it's a tech company too. So, um, kind of how do those things interact to, to to help you decide? You know, this is this is the next artist that we want to partner with. Yeah, we look for all sorts of things that can make a compelling partnership. And something that I love about Spotify and that drew me to the company in the first place is the mission statement, which mm -hmm. is to enable a million artists to live off of their work and a billion fans to be inspired by it. So mm -hmm. the mission of the company is really about um, building a robust middle class of creators mm -hmm. that can really um, build more sustainable careers. So with that kind of North Star mission in mind, that means that when we think about what type of partnership we might structure with an artist, it doesn't matter. It's not just superstars. We're also mm -hmm. really interested in, you know, the 16 year old who is sort of making their first album and is interested in um, finding a good way to connect with fans on the platform. So it, it really runs the gamut from people who are earlier starting out all the way up to, you know, the Dua Lipa's, the J Balvin's, the superstar releases. I think the thing that um, we always look for is a plan. Uh, mm. It's a lot easier to partner with an artist when they have a good plan. So that's one of the sort of um, key enablers of a strong mm -hmm. partnership. And, you know, this industry and the artistic process is, you know, it, it moves fast without a doubt. And mm -hmm. I know from, you know, my time in artist management, how compelling it can be to finish a project and just put it out right away. And the internet makes that so easy. Mm -hmm. But if an artist can kind of complete a, a project to their standards, take a pause and develop a plan, it makes it a lot easier for a company like Spotify to digest that. Um, so that's one. Two, music, right? <laughs> you should right. go without saying that like good music um, is just, it's undeniable and it, and it does most of the work for itself. So we can come in and we can provide 
some marketing concepts, some stories, um, but you know, the, the music is really the, where the magic happens. So um, that's a second piece of it, making excellent music, things that are to a high artistic standard. And then the third thing that I would say um, that we look for is a good story, right? Um, somebody who has built a really authentic connection with their fan base. And, you know, it's interesting, like it used to be that you would develop a fan base in your neighborhood or in your town, and then you would tour and maybe you developed a fan base in sort of the town over and then maybe statewide and then maybe nationally. Right. Today, you can develop a fan base anywhere in the world, right? You could be right. a Korean artist and your first fans could be in Brazil. Um, but what we look for is artists who have developed a really sticky connection with their fans where you see people um, consuming, maybe it's not millions of fans, but if it's a small base and they're consuming that artist on a daily basis or a weekly basis, if they're streaming that song over and over, these are good indications that, wow, like this artist has an interesting story. This artist is doing something different that really stands out. Um, a few things to comment on. One, I like totally get that artists don't necessarily want to plan just because it's so easy to make music now. Um, and I would say it's like in my artist management career, that was like one of the more difficult things um, that I had to deal with just speaking with clients. It was like, yo, the album is done. Let's just put it out. It's done. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd be like, wait, there has to be like, we have to build momentum um, in order to actually make it pop the way that we want to. And I feel like, you know, and I'm just thinking about it now, before when albums were pressed and stuff, like you had to have a plan because they could, you, you could only press so many albums and put them out before, like there, there was a time period for that as, a, as opposed to like the sometimes 24 hours it takes to like actually get something on a DSP. Um, so I just thought it was interesting that you brought that up. Another thing that I kind of wanted to ask about, um, at least the planning uh, sub point you made is how much, how, how is, how important is it to like kind of have a team or is that not something that you guys necessarily um, look like, is it not something that you guys really check for? Or like, you know, if you see a manager and you see a booking agent, you see a publicist, like how does that, um, I guess, influence your decision as well? Yeah. I mean, we, we try to really not um, take those things as sort of uh, um, something that would sway our opinion, you know, and we um, certainly love working directly with artists themselves, um, but we also respect and understand that every artist has uh, different needs, different ambitions, and so, you know, it may make sense for an artist to sign to a label, sign with a publicist, get a manager, get an agent, um, but, you know, we we usually try to sort of be agnostic to those variables and just really look at what the data is indicating and what we're able to see um, when we research that artist online. And, you know, some, some people can get pretty far doing it on their own. Other people, for good reasons, you know, surround themselves with an excellent team. I think, you know, the majority of the artists that we partner with have kind of reached a stage in their career where they're starting to bring on some teammates to fill out the the gaps um but that's not that's not 100 percent of the artists sometimes we find some artists that are like really new just starting right. out and you know don't even yet have a manager and we love those stories um and trying to kind of help those artists kick start their careers right right and and speaking of stories um and i love asking people this because everybody has a different answer but what do you think makes a good story what do you think makes an engaging story from an artist that's a really good question. Um, I'm big on authenticity. Um, and I really think that's become more prevalent in today's world where there's so much information accessible to people. And, um, you know, you can just, you can just kind of tell if somebody doesn't really believe in and represent the story that they're telling. So I think authenticity is super key. Um, certainly in my world, as I've worked with artists from all these different cultures, I am really, my head is turned when you see an artist that mm -hmm. really stands for the place that they came from and the um, sort of style that they represent. You look at Rosalia, you look at mm -hmm. some of the K-pop stuff, you look at mm -hmm. 
some of the um, Colombian kind of interesting genres coming out. So I think there's a sort of move towards authenticity that is um, really inspiring and appealing. Um, and then I think a strong visual aesthetic is also um, helpful. And it doesn't have to be, you know, some artists don't put their face out there, right? They create kind of like an avatar um, or more like image-based aesthetic. But having an aesthetic that has a strong brand, that has some recognizable elements where you see something, you kind of say, oh, that looks like insert kind of artist. I think that is a big differentiator too. Um, so yeah, authenticity, aesthetic, and then, um, you know, something else that I think will never sacrifice in the music industry is strong live performances. Um, there are definitely creators out there that are making a living, um, just off of their streaming, but I'm hopeful that as soon as we come back from this pandemic, live come back, come back stronger than ever. And I think every artist should continue to cultivate their their live side of the business right right yeah um being authentic i feel like nowadays you can kind of point that out like very clearly because there's so many different angles for you to get to know an artist there's like there's obviously dsps and the music that you put out but there in addition to the interviews that we're used to there's twitter facebook instagram <laughs> like you have you if you're not if you're not yourself on all of these platforms i feel like it's more obvious now than it like ever has been you know totally. one of them you're acting different then people can point it out. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Gen Z. I'm, I'm <laughs> unfortunately, too old to know myself. But from what I see from these young kids these days, like they want people to be real. They want the no makeup selfie. Um, mm -hmm. They want people to just like, you know, not be plastic, which I think is a beautiful thing. Um, yeah, and, and a good thing for for the whole industry. It's kind of like um, the general genre of like bedroom pop was sort yeah. of invented of just people being extremely honest and vulnerable in like their bedrooms you know um bedroom pop to me as a as a term i'm sort of iffy about it but i get what they mean which is in what i hear is just honesty and vulnerability in music um and a, and um, a, and approachability um so i totally get you um uh I kind of want to pivot now to the international side of things because I don't really know too many people or interacted with too many people that have um, just been exposed to so many different cultures uh, and so many and so many different genres of music. Um, so I guess like just start off the bat at a very high level, like what's some uh, some super interesting things that you've learned just studying different markets, um, different players in the game in different countries. Uh, what are some things that, you know, when you took the job, you weren't necessarily aware of that, you know, it kind of opened your eyes when you, when you did get introduced to all these different uh, corners of the universe? Yeah, boy, I've, I've loved it. I've loved every <laughs> second of it. I think it's, um, I think music is uh, a, it's a thought leader in terms of cultural connections. Music is sort of beyond language it transcends language there's something just like so inherently human about music and so to be able to work in this international capacity and see how these connections are happening across cultures and how music is influencing and kind of bringing about um cultural change is just like such an extraordinary privilege and something that i love to do Right. Um, I think one of the early realizations was that the world is is definitely globalizing. You know, we're more connected than ever before, and a platform mm -hmm. like Spotify is borderless. Like it was built with no borders. You can be a user anywhere in the world that we have enabled this platform, and you can find content from anywhere else in the world, mm -hmm. and that is just. That, that is a re relatively new thing for fans yeah. of music. Um, so a lot of the you know early users we have in markets, like for example, we just launched in Russia. There's a there's a really um, high consumption of international music. You know, people are interested in in listening to artists from other cultures. So definitely mm -hmm. notice that wow, you know, the world is globalizing. We are all very connected. 
And then I think the other realization, which is almost the opposite, is like, wow, the world is big. You know, there is so much going on out there. There are so many incredible um, cultures and subcultures. And so the music industry that was sort of traditionally dominated by a handful of sort of more mature markets, US, UK, we are in a, in a, in a much more diversified environment now where some of the incredible beats coming out of India could make their way into, you know, a global top 50 list or some of the incredible genres that we see across the continent of Africa and throughout Latin America. You know, these things are, these things are incredible. They're going to, they're going to move. They're going to change the sound of, of kind of the global pop zeitgeist. Right. Right. And then for, um, for international artists who you said, you know, a little bit earlier in the conversation as well, that you can kind of have your fan base anywhere. Um, and this kind of comes also from one of our patrons standard as well. Like what does, um, what does engagement look like when you have an audience that's not based in your territory? What are some, ses- some successful ways that you've seen people really uh, take advantage of and uh, be authentic and engage with, with, with artists that or with, with fans and fan bases that aren't based where they, where they're based. Yeah, I think um, one of the, uh, we'll take K-pop as an example. And, you know, K-pop, I think most people have seen or heard some of the um, kind of K-pop superstars that have really become pretty global phenomenons, BTS being one that Spotify partnered with really early. Some of the most cutting edge marketing that I see artists doing is when they actually sort of um, present their art in the context of a local market. And so one specific example of this is something that we've done recently with K-pop in Brazil, where we have started K-pop Cafe, which even just in the title of that playlist, it is a fusion of cultures, right? Mm -hmm. K-pop is, you know, everything that it is, a cafe culture and the idea of coffee, this is kind of very Brazilian. So you see like a true, fusion of the cultures. I think the first step is always like introducing this new sound or look or style. But then the next step is when a culture actually starts to embrace that and kind of bring it into the fold of their local music. And that's when you Mm. see like these really, um, it's like adoption. It's not like you're looking at something that is different. It's like you're actually like pulling it in and making it your own. So you see K-pop sort of increasingly, there'll be profiles of fans they might listen to K-pop in Brazil, but then they also listen to Sertanejo, which is like a local Brazilian genre or to Brazilian funk. That's how mm. you really know, like you've gotten in the mix. Like K-pop is like not going anywhere. It's like Brazilians love K-pop. So these are sort right. of really interesting ways that I think artists can deepen the connection across a culture. Um, the other question I get a lot is around language barrier. And I think k pop is mm-hmm. an interesting example. Um, BTS, for example, just reached, released Dynamite, which was their first English, all English language single. And I think that there's a lot you can do to play with language. Um, you see this with Latin artists, too. If you go back to Bieber's Despacito, where mm-hmm. you had Luis Fonzi singing in Spanish and then Bieber singing in Spanish and then verses in English or um, uh, Mi Gente. Um, there's so many different examples yeah. where you know, artists are kind of melding languages. And if you can kind of insert a little bit of a hook in your song that is something mm-hmm. that somebody's like, oh, I understood that part. I think that can be another kind of interesting way of, um, if you see a big spike of fans in a country that speaks another language, do you throw a little verse in that kind of caters right. to the fans and lets Make them, them feel seen. To you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And when it comes to, I mean, it, it's interesting because obviously, um, I mean, a lot of the biggest markets, and I know we're based in the U.S., so like completely biased from like what's international perspective. But I mean, a lot of the biggest cities and biggest markets of users on Spotify aren't actually even based in the U.S., right? Like I, I think you mentioned like Brazil, like Sao Paulo is in like one of the top 10, right? What are some of the other like major music markets outside of like the, the typical when you think of music industry, which would be like London, L.A. and New York? Totally. Yeah. I mean, Mexico City is like the streaming capital, like Mexico City streams like crazy. Spotify actually threw uh, awards show in Mexico um, just before we all kind of went 
uh, to work from home that was just a big celebration of just how rich the, the music culture is in Mexico. Um, so that's certainly a big one. Um, in Southeast Asia, there are some markets that really stream like crazy. So the Philippines and Indonesia are streaming capitals in a sense. Um, and then Brazil, as we mentioned, and then, you know, some of the more mature markets in Europe, certainly France and Germany and Spain, um, Italy. So we see mm -hmm. pretty high streaming rates. We also are seeing growth in Turkey, which is kind of an interesting um, market where there's, there's a lot of lo local Turkish music that's really taking root in a pretty vibrant scene there. So um, it's definitely an expanded universe from sort of the traditional, right. like you said, at New York, London, Los Angeles. Right. And then when it comes to, I mean, because I know a lot of your background too, even prior to joining Spotify, I was focused a lot on like artist marketing. Um, I mean, it's, we recently had a conversation with somebody from the, the chart metric team who focuses uh, a lot on like different music analytics and is able to really see, um, and they even kind of did some research on some of the, the top international Spotify markets, seemingly very aligned with some of what you just mentioned. When it comes to, um, the like growth strategy for artists. Obviously, I think the, the traditional adage or the traditional approach is always like start in your hometown and go from there. You already alluded to the fact that like we don't have to follow that mold anymore. And then from like a, a marketing perspective, I think it's interesting because if you're running ads like the, to reach a thousand people in Mexico versus in New York City is going to be night and day from like a, a CPM perspective. So sometimes it can be a much more cost effective route to, to target fans in international cities. Do you see like um, it making, I mean, it, now having worked on kind of both sides of the table, when you think about how an artist should focus on developing their audience, um, how, how do you feel they should think about targeting various cities or various geographies? Yeah. I wish I had like a potion, like a secret yeah, yeah. sauce. I think that it's definitely not one size fits all and... Mm -hmm. There are new strategies coming forward every day, new platforms, new tools. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, you know, the the artists that are staying on top of those and kind of early adopters of those things um, are well positioned. Um, I think, you know, you get more data than you could ever get before, mm -hmm. right? The, the idea that you can release a song, get pretty detailed analytics on where your audience is and who they are. Um, provides you the ability to then lean in and do more targeting um, to mm -hmm. those to those fans. And Spotify is certainly working on providing artists with more options if they see something happening, sort of what action that can they take to mm -hmm. deepen the connection. Um, so I wish I had like a, you know, sort of like some, some tricks of the trade, but I think, you know, definitely staying on top of the data, um, looking for those spikes, um, mm -hmm and making sure that you're kind of creative about strategies to reach those audiences is, is kind of the one uh, constant truth. Mm -hmm. No, that makes a lot of sense too. And uh, yeah, always going kind of case by case. In that same vein too, I, I feel like Spotify is an incredibly high performing organization. I think the growth is phenomenal. I think it's not slowing down anytime soon. Um, in your experience working with teams, uh, I mean, <laughs> Music industry can be a funny place. Lots of big personalities. It was joking around. I feel like characters, characters per capita in this industry is like higher than most other industries. So I'm sure you've worked with a mix of like teams prior to Spotify that weren't necessarily as high performing. And it was probably challenging to wrangle even what might seem to be basic tasks. But now on the flip side, I mean... It, I think um, Spotify has also done a seemingly, at least from the external and other conversation I've had, a good job at, at kind of uh, cultivating and maintaining a very entrepreneurial spirit, despite the fact that it is becoming a massive corporation. From your perspective, having worked with different artist teams, different organizations, different partners, what do you feel are, are some of the most important elements uh, of, a, of a high performing team? A uh, great question. Um definitely a diverse set of opinions. Um, and I mean, diverse in sort of every definition of that word. Um, you know, I really feel like, uh, in order to, um, make the, the most informed decisions, you got to look at things from every angle. 
And so I think that's extremely important. I certainly have seen that evidenced in the international work that we're doing. Like just, um, there are so many different solutions to a problem. And the more solutions you can look at, the better chances you have sort of picking the one that is right for, for you. So I really believe in building balanced and diverse teams. Um, I would also say that, you know, there's uh, an importance in having like a, um, values, like strong values. So within my team at Spotify, we have um, the team mission. And when we were first getting started as a team, when it was still just two or three of us, we sat down and we crafted our values and our ground rules, which is sort of what do we believe in? How do we show up for people? And then, you know, what are the ground rules in terms of where do we draw boundaries? When do we step away from work? How do we make sure that we're protecting, you know, our longevity, our sustainability as an organization, um, how we treat one another and how we treat our colleagues and by extension, um, artists in the broader industry. So those types of kind of like moral and ethical compasses for teams, I think are absolutely critical because it's really not about the short term, like the creative process and working in a creative industry is like, it is, it is, um, unpredictable at times there are spurts of sort of inspiration and you can move really fast but you just got to make sure that you continue to kind of come back to center and work towards that long-term vision that's just again another reason why um you know i'm a fan of the spotify mission the idea that we're really working towards a more sustainable future for creative people like yeah that's what it's, yeah, it's powerful about. to be grounded in a ethos like that too and then i think even as far as like working towards that vision i know you mentioned that one of the most the things that you're most excited about at spotify is kind of the work you're doing with the strategy team with regards to planning and operations i think that's probably fun because then it's kind of how do we break apart this massive mission into kind of bite-sized stepping stone chunks that we can accomplish so in that, that yeah. same vein of like high performing teams and the tips you just mentioned like are there any frameworks that you've learned or kind of picked up throughout the years um, when it comes to setting goals and really achieving those goals as an, as an organization and kind of being able to really kind of keep a pulse and, and track progress against those goals? Yeah, I think um, there are some sort of tricks of the trade to project management. And, you know, like I said, I'm a big fan of having sort of a long-term vision that's motivating to people, that's inspirational, something that kind of people feel like if there's a down day or a down week, like they still know their North Star and direction. And as long as the work that they're doing is taking them towards that direction, um, they're probably doing the right thing. I'm also a really big fan of structuring teams that have um, space for innovation. So something I've done with my team is that there's sort of the core responsibilities as written in the job description, but then assuming people are performing in those core responsibilities, we take on focus areas or innovation areas. So sort of saying, how are we always stretching beyond sort of what's written on the page to try to push people forward? And you never know, sometimes really incredible initiatives come out of that kind of like innovation time. Um, and then, you know, there's kind of what I consider interesting, maybe not interesting to most conventional planning. So um, a week over week cycle, you know, the industry moves week over week, music is released week over week month over month, quarterly, and annually. Those are kind of the, the primary planning cycles. And, um, you know, as a large company, Spotify definitely looks at quarters and then at annual planning. And I think sometimes um, artists and their teams don't think about the calendar and those sort of neat and tidy chunks. But for, even for an artist, like, are you going to release in Q4 or Q2? Kind of going back to that theme of having a good plan kind of thinking mm -hmm. about your partners and some of the bigger companies that you might work with who plan on a more conventional business calendar. It's important to kind of think those things through and make sure that you're strategically timing your release and all that. So um, I'm much more, you know, I'm, I'm sort of more passionate about the bigger picture things like structuring teams that have purpose and value and a good diverse set of perspectives. But there's also, you can't, you can't ignore the side of the coin that is organization, follow-up, consistency, mm -hmm. delivery, execution, all that. 
Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm right there with you. I uh, I worked in operations in my last position, and um, there's just something really satisfying about seeing things through and feeling like they were done in the in in the proper way, and that communication went through the proper channels. And and specifically for artist management, it's kind of like this huge puzzle to begin with, like figuring out what the artist wants and having that align with the business plan and then working with your team to actually get things pushed through and being able to kind of like rein everything in into something that's tangible and a, and, and a product that everybody got behind in like a real way, in a real organized way, I do think uh, is important. And I totally get like the satisfaction from, from doing that, absolutely. 100%. Yeah, yeah the, uh, one other point that I think is kind of um, something I've been uniquely thinking about by virtue of working at, with a lot of engineers mm-hmm. is, is the concept of scale. So as mm-hmm. you're thinking about kind of stress testing an idea, does this scale? Um, you know, right. is this something that um, doesn't require a ton of sort of bespoke effort? Or is, and, and some things deserve that, right? There are some moments and some campaigns and some projects that require just like a lot of one-time bespoke effort. But there mm-hmm. are other things like, for example, your logo. Does this scale? Like, can this be replicated? Does it work in different colors? Does it work in mm. different cultural settings? Like, those are um, really important considerations too. So, um, I often try to just add that as a layer of kind of due diligence when we're looking at projects. Is does this scale? How does this scale? Right, and I mean that also. At least, uh, it seems like that also is tied to uh, you know things in terms of like roles. And yes. like, you know, people's yeah. trajectories in the company. It's like, how how is this person going to scale as well? Or how totally. is the team going to scale? And how is everyone going to scale within it? It's like yeah. kind of relevant Processes to every situation. and yeah. um, roles and yeah, designing organizations that are just really sturdy, that are durable. Right. Where you got longevity and you've got sort of a good infrastructure Um, on which you can grow. It's certainly been key to market expansions as we've looked Mm -hmm. at expanding Spotify into new territories. Um, You know, we got to figure out efficient ways to scale. Right. Awesome. And then I guess just from like the people aspect of it, um, what are some successes or or lessons that you've learned uh, in just like managing people in general and trying to determine what that scale is for people's careers and kind of like the more human aspect of it? I am, um, I think that with management, you, um, I try at least to really be service oriented as a leader. Um, and so it's, it's a privilege to lead people and you kind of try to take a service mindset in terms of how can I help this person succeed, thrive, bloom, contribute to their maximum potential um, in an organization. And so I try to, um, you know, really work with a person to understand what they want to achieve, what their sort of unique talents are, and then um, set them up for success and continue to give them stretches and challenges that kind of push them further into uh, whatever aptitudes and kind of goals and ambitions they may have. The other side of it, though, is just being really honest and upfront with people. Um, You know, I think that... uh, in my career, I've got good feedback, I've gotten negative feedback, I've gotten mediocre feedback, all that has really helped me to progress. And so I really try to um, be upfront, be direct, you know, kind of be quick with feedback to people so that they know if I'm giving feedback, it's always in the interest of progressing us all to kind of where we want to go. Um, but yeah, I really try to be kind of service oriented and, and, and be there for the people that I manage to create the best team culture we can. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm sure Sam was excited to hear you being like completely honest and transparent because whenever him and I have a tiff about the podcast, he's like radical transparency, man, <laughs> radical transparency. <laughs> that's, 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 that's like his thing. Um, and he's, it's way he's easier to me. move through challenges if you can just keep it real right you know address things quickly and then move on you know i think sometimes where teams get twisted is if things sort of sit for too long so right and if you have that background of this person cares about you and yes they said this thing but you know that they're invested in you then you know not to take it personally and you know that it's in your best interest so it's like also building that foundation of that's uh you know serving like you're saying yeah i also try to make sure that 
I set my team up with multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. Um, So they have other mentors, you know, they don't just look to sort of one boss or in this case to me, they don't say, Hey, you know, they, they should be getting multiple perspectives. And I think this is important for everybody in their career is that you sort of build um, your kind of personal board of advisors and you can turn to get sort of multiple perspectives if you're struggling to overcome some type of professional challenge you know, maybe you need advice from, from a different angle. So again, going back to building diverse teams and for yourself as well, making sure that you have that balance set of mentors is really important. Yeah. Um, no. Sam, I'm actually like also wondering since you own a company, um, kind of how you approach some of the same things. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, leading through productive questioning, is very valuable in my experience as well. Cause it's like, if you can, uh, you can like lead the, the horse to the water, but you can't make it drink. So I think being able to help guide people towards their own realizations and setting their own goals that they will accomplish. I read actually a book by Jocko Willink on leadership strategy and tactics. And he, he said, even if you're, if there's somebody that you're managing and you're giving them, um, say you can come up with a plan to accomplish something and your plan is 90% fantastic right and they come up with a plan and then technically you manage them you may have more experience but their plan is only 65 percent is good simply that they're going to follow through on their plan and the fact that it's an idea they've come up with the, the fact they have such a more vested interest in executing upon their own plan that if you were to force your plan that's 90 percent is good it's like chances are if they execute upon their plan it'll be better so that's been a really interesting like change for me to not go like, hey, you need to do this, you need to get this done. It's, but like, hey, have you thought about like approaching this this way, or like, have you? Uh, what else should we think about with regards to this? And like probing for more thought around an objective. So I think that's probably been one of the biggest things. It's so true, and there's a truism out there like tell people what to do, but not how to do it. You know, allow them to come up with the plan. I think that's so true. I've certainly benefited from having some great mentors and previous managers in my career who, um, who have given me the opportunity to like kind of approach in my way. And, you know, that's how you learn. Yeah, for sure. No, a thousand percent. When it comes to the side of, I kind of want to d- double back to some of the artist partnership stuff we were talking about, because I think obviously, uh, I mean, I think the mission is incredible. Like the Spotify mission is incredible and I excited to see it come to fruition. I, I think with that said, obviously, there's tons of artists that are largely utilizing the platform. I know Spotify for artists puts out tons of really incredible resources for artists and their, their, their teams and managers to learn how they can best leverage the platform and all that it has to offer. From your perspective, I mean, obviously dealing with lots of artist partnerships from a very like high level and, and facilitating and help leading some of the, the teams that are dealing on the, the more tactical side, what do you see as some of the, um, for, for artists and teams that might not be as aware, what are some of the, more kind of concrete ways in which artists can partner with Spotify or some of the artist partnerships initiatives that they should be aware of. Yeah, I think that the, um, the tools that you've mentioned, something like Spotify for artists is like the first um, point of entry for an artist. So, you know, as we launch in a new market and I keep on bringing up Russia, which is a really recent launch for us, you know, we try to go out and speak directly to artists and say, this is how you can claim your profile. There's a lot of interesting things that you can do in S4A. You can update your bio, you can update multiple images, you can select an artist pick. So, you know, really like utilizing all of those functions, educating yourself on those functions and using those to to make sure that your real estate on the platform is is as compelling as possible, is a really accessible point of entry. And then to do the same thing across other platforms, for sure, just like making sure that um, you have you have everything kind of set up. Um, and then beyond sort of those entry level things, there's some kind of new functionality. We're introducing things like Canvas, which is the sort of looping visual layer that can accompany a track. Um, there's a pitch tool. So if you have a new focus track coming up, you can submit that through Spotify for artists and, you know, completing those things, uh, you know, really does make a difference. Like what is the instrumentation in the track? Um, what type of context can you offer the track? What kind of musical influences? There's a lot of sort of information that you can provide on the track that really helps um, us to try to find the best place to put those tracks. And we have, I can really guarantee you, we have editors that sit and listen 
all day, every day, all over the world, trying to um, to make sure that we catch good stuff. And then we also have product based solutions like Release Radar that are really designed to try to get those tracks out there. So at the most kind of accessible entry point, it's utilizing those tools, taking the time to read about them and, and utilize them. And then I think the next step um, is usually like, you'll see if something starts to catch, if you see a song or you have an album and you really see something that is like a unique anomaly, um, reaching out either via your distributor or your management team or personally to Spotify to kind of try to tell that story. Usually we have enough data that we will proactively reach out to artists that we want to do these sort of higher level partnerships with. Um, but every once in a while, there'll be something that we catch wind, um, wind of that comes through um, submission forms and you know, making sure that you're telling the best story that you can about what's happening with the data, what, what we might not be seeing in the data, if there's like some, some crazy statistics coming from elsewhere. Um, and then, you know, we just have this privilege and opportunity to kind of look through so many great tracks and great campaigns and find the ones that make sense for us to partner on. Yeah. Um, I still do some management consulting and the yeah. first question that I get from people is like, how do I get more streams on Spotify? And before I, I'm like, how do you, before we even get to that point, like, are you using all of the tools that Spotify has given you for you to do that yourself? <laughs> like, are, like, what does your bio look like? Like, are you using Spotify for artists? Like, have you used literally all of the tools that they've given you? I think, I think people think, um, at least in a lot of respects, like, you know, if I get a manager, um, they'll kind of do some of that work for me. Or if I get uh, a label, they'll kind of do some of that work for me. And that's not false. Um, but in order to even get to that point, it's like, you gotta, you gotta start looking at the Spotify blogs with the videos on like how to, how to submit tracks and start yeah. looking at some of your, like your favorite artists and what are their pages look like? You know, how yeah. are they using, how are they using spotlighting for, for tours or for yeah. songs and just being yeah. like, you know, what things can I take from my own profile? Um, I think that's huge that a lot of, a lot of early artists overlook for sure. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's easy to think that there's like a way to kind of skip that stuff, but you know, mm -hmm. we really do look and if you see something really compelling happening, a song starting to break, an artist starting to break, and then you go and you see that they don't have any information kind of filled out, mm -hmm. it's like, well, it seems like maybe this artist doesn't want to work with Spotify. So I do encourage all artists to seize those entry points. Um, and then, you know, I think I would also just say build outside of Spotify too. I'm obviously like, I think Spotify is an excellent platform and a resource and I think it's a great company, but you should also be building your fan base through other channels and through, you know, other kind of business lines, merchandise, live, et cetera. I think it's, it's important for artists to not have too much of a single platform mindset. Yeah. Painting a full picture. Yeah. Yeah, and even, I mean, just single markets too. I mean, in the spirit of yeah. international, when it comes to the, um, I mean, and then from an international expansion standpoint, I mean, is it, it's on the artist partnership side, you're finding lots of different local influencers. And I mean, when it, if there's like a new market that you're hoping to activate Spotify in, um, how are you approaching kind of breaking into that market? I think this will probably be one of the last things we'll start to close around. Sure. Yeah, the... Um the international expansion part of the job is really interesting because uh, you look at a number of factors. The local music culture is, to me, the most important. And as international music head, I really um, care deeply and try to advocate that we launch in markets that have really um, kind of cutting edge music scenes, interesting things going on. But we also look at broader business and legal conditions in a market. And so, um, you know, sort of some of the more um, standard business case inputs around like the gross domestic product of a country and what are the conditions for technology companies launching in that country? What's type of regulation that might be involved? There's a lot of stuff that a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me put into those business cases. I try to look at what's the local music scene like um, what are the local genres that are dominant? What are the opportunities where we see genres might be on a hyper growth trajectory? What are the licensors? Sort of what's the state of play in terms of market share? Is it a market that's dominated by one large 
distributor licensor or is it a more diversified market where you got a lot of small independents? So, um, you know, there's a, a kind of infinite number of factors that go into preparing a market launch and evaluating where to go next. Um, we're in 92 countries now, and we are hoping to expand fast to really make sure that Spotify is everywhere in the world. So it's an interesting part of my job. Awesome. Um, what do you think is a market that you um, expanded into or launched into that kind of changed the way that you thought about music as a whole? Like what was kind of like that first market where you were kind of like, oh, wow, the world is a really big place, you know? Yeah. The, in the first couple months in this particular role, we launched in the Middle East and North Africa and South Africa. So it was a cluster mm. of 13 markets. And then shortly thereafter, we launched in India. And those mm -hmm. were very eye-opening um, market launches um, India in particular is such an interesting market because Bollywood music and film music continue to be a really dominant genre in India. And so, um, the whole kind of dynamics that shape the industry are, are just, are just really different. And you got to think about things from a completely different angle. Um, so on Spotify in India, we think about who are the major actors, who are the major mm -hmm. songwriters, who are the major composers. Um, whereas, you know, in the States, it's maybe with the exception of Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga and A Star is Born, there's usually kind of the musicians and then there's the actors in India. It's just a completely different, <laughs> right. completely different thing. Awesome. Awesome. The other market well, I would say everybody should keep an eye on is Japan. Japan, Japan. Is, is so special and so unique and some really interesting. I got I got to get to know Japan. I've been I've been consuming a lot of Japanese content over quarantine, Japanese TV shows, read yeah. a Japanese book on minimalism. So <laughs> I'm definitely I'm definitely going to get into get into uh, Japanese music as well. Japan's got a really interesting um, artistic culture. South Africa as well. We've seen some really amazing stuff coming from South Africa. So. Right, right. And I know um, Japan has an interesting relationship with hip hop music. It's like, yeah. it's like the cool thing. So like if, uh, you know, Lupe Fiasco, I, I, he was one of the earliest people in my life to talk about Japan so heavily in his music and talk about like going to Japan and Pharrell talking about like going to Japan. So yeah, I'm kind of investigating that side of the world is interesting There's for a million. So of much reasons. cultural exchange happening, and hip hop yeah. is such a force. Um, you know, I think we see hip hop growing pretty much in every culture all around the world. Local hip hop scenes are really thriving. Right, right. And it's been great. It's been great to see. Um, yeah, well, I want to thank you for coming out. Like this conversation was just as pleasant as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, so Thanks, definitely John. glad that you. Definitely glad that you could come out and uh, shed some light on a few different things. You, you do a good amount of stuff at, at Spotify, and I hope we did each part of it justice. Um, and just want to thank you again for, for coming out. Absolutely, Jordan. So I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing, and it's a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for taking the time with me. Of course. Of course. Thank of course. you. Man, I thought that was a super insightful episode. Um, Madeline, you know, she wears so many hats and I feel like we did do each one justice by going through each one that she laid out in the beginning of the episode. Um, before this episode, you know, a close friend of mine who actually referred her to the podcast said that she was cool, calm and collected. We got to see that in person, despite how many hats that she actually wears. So it was just great to be around her energy. Um, and I'm glad that we got somebody on, you know, with her stature, especially at a company like Spotify. Um, obviously, Spotify's reputation precedes itself. Um, and it was just super awesome to get somebody on, especially Madeline, Madeline on here, to uh, speak about some of the projects that she's been involved in, to give some advice to the artists that are listening. So what do you think, Sam? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was incredible, and I'm super grateful we finally got somebody on, on from Spotify. Obviously, Spotify is, is a really incredible company that's empowering so many different musicians and on the mission of trying to help them build a full-time living off their career. So I think it's, it's all grounded in this very empowering ethos. And I think they're doing an incredible job breaking into new markets left and right and just continuing to innovate how they support and serve artists and help artists thrive. So super grateful for all the work that she's doing and hope you guys were able to walk away with some very tactical tips on how you can further accelerate your growth on Spotify. So you know, you know where to find us. We'll be back here next week. We appreciate your support so, so much. And uh, keep on keeping on. Keep on doing great things. We all out here together. One love. Music Business Podcast. We out.